Yes, it's a big change. The 180. Your life will be the same. The 180. The 180, y'all. The 180. <laughs> I am so honored and excited to have my guest, William Jackson Harper, here today. Woo! All right, that, that's a long applause. Um, but you deserve it. But you deserve it, Will. Uh, thanks, brother. Uh, you know, you, you were saying that theme song was long before we started. Is that, that's not that long. That's not, that's a, that's a, it's like, you are like, like, this is a little long. I'd hate to cut it off. But it's like, that's, that's a theme song, man. Th thank you. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I grew up in the, you know, late 80s, 90s when theme songs were like a big deal. Yeah. And now most, you know, most shows are kind of like, okay, we'll give you a little da -da 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 -da. That's it. Yeah. So I was just like, I, I really want a theme song. Yeah, dude, I was doing, I was doing this, uh, uh, this voiceover gig recently and they were like, you know, so after the end of this, uh, you know, after the end of this piece of action, just hum a little something to yourself, you know, as a character. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. And my brain automatically went to the theme from the A-Team. Like, just, yes. <laughs> like, that's exactly <laughs> where my brain went. Yes. And I was just like, yo, that's just in there, taking right. up space. I could be using it, for, using it for other things, but instead, I just got the theme from the A-Team at the ready, pretty and much is. at all times. So I was like, right. wow. okay. Those theme songs are effective, baby. Yeah, man. <laughs> Um, well, I, I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with William Jackson Harper, but I'm going to give you an ap appropriate little intro, sir. Um, William Jackson Harper is a critically acclaimed American actor and playwright. He's best known for portraying Chitty. I okay, I knew I was going to do that. I knew I was going to do that. And I said, Black man, don't do this. Okay. I really did. I was like, don't do that. Don't do that. You, you, anyway. It it's a lot it's 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 more syllables than american right. tongues are accustomed to on average it makes I sense i think so yeah and like i said don't say like don't say it how it looks say it how you want to say it and, and yeah. when you're reading you want to say exactly how it looks but anyway he is best known for portraying chitty and Gyonwe, kind of said it on the nbc <laughs> comedy the good place Will received his first Emmy nomination this year for Best Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series woo -woo, for that, and also received a Critics' Choice Television Award in the same category both this year, 2020, and in 2019 for his work on The Good Place. Will also has acting credits in a variety of film, television, and stage projects, including Midsommar, uh, Midsommar, is, uh, is there a special it's, way to say that? It's, it, you can say Midsommar or just Midsommar. I mean, it's fine. It's, okay. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it, it was, I mean, it was an intense film. So if you saw it, you know it's, it's strange and weird and beautiful and a lot of things. Uh, Dark Waters is another film that Will was in and Patterson. Um, he lit up the stage here in New York City in The Total Bent, a really awesome rock blue, blues and soul musical by Stu, who also wrote Broadway's Passing Strange. And Will's writing credits, Will's writing credits include his play Traysville, which premiered at the Ensemble Studio Theater in 2018. Aha, yes. It's, it's Travis, Travisville. Travisville, I'm sorry. You know what? You know what? <laughs> I'm sorry. This is, this is going to be a fun one. People are going to know. <laughs> People are gonna know that Eric, Eric Lockley of the 180 will will, <laughs> will fix things if he gets it wrong. Let, let's, you know, let's honor that. I, I'll fix it if I get it wrong. It was, Will wrote his play Travisville, which premiered at the Ensemble Studio Theater in 2018. And not only does he act and write, but he also plays the drums in the band. He's a member of the band, the US Open. Um, upcoming projects include the Amazon limited series, The Underground Railroad, which was based on the book of the same name and is adapted for the screen by Barry Jenkins and just announced today, it's November 5th because this, you know, you all will hear it a different day than it is, but announced today, Will will be the lead of season two of Love Life on HBO Max. So congratulations for that, brother. Thanks, man. Um, but I am so excited to have William Jackson Harper as my guest. I'm gonna give you a little... How are you doing today? I'm great, man. I'm great. Yeah. Went on a, a big, long hike today. Um, it was like six miles, something like that, just about. Wow. So okay. It was, like yeah. Cali it life. Was, 
Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, it's, that's pretty much all there is to do that feels remotely safe. So, yeah. you know, like that's you what know, me and uh, me and my girlfriend got up and got out and, you know, like went for a long, long hike. I discovered that my shoes are destroyed. They're done. Oh no. Like, oh no. You know, like when you're on a hike or when you're running and like your feet hurt and then your knees hurt and then right. like, you know, and you're just like, but the shoes are still together, but the, mm -hmm. they just you're, hurt. You're not even more. thinking. You're not even thinking that it's the shoes. No, because it's like they don't have holes in them. They're not flopping, right. but it's just like, dang, this hurts a lot more. Just like I'm like a mile into something and it hurts to walk. And I'm like, uh -huh. dang, is that does that mean that it's like it's that time, time to get new stuff? And I, you know, um, so anyway, but yeah, like that's that's what we did. We got a, uh, you know, I got myself some new tennis shoes. Went on a hike. <laughs> nice. That's, that's okay. about it. As long as you're not resistant, I know, I know uh, in my family, my, my mother would be like, t would say to my father, Bobby, j just get new shoes. And my father was always like trying to fix things or be like, you know, justify why he doesn't need to buy something new. Yeah. It's like, no, don't do that. Just, just get it. Just, just get, just the, get new the new thing. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm go. bad with like any sort of athletic stuff, like yeah. anything like running shoes, shirts, you know, workout, any of that stuff. I don't. I, I still act like a high schooler uh -huh. who was <laughs> dramatically unathletic. You know, just like I just wear whatever was the dirtiest thing or the right. oldest thing that I have. I just, you know, I don't, I don't do the whole athleisure thing and like investing in your fitness gear. I never did that. And so it's not until recently my girlfriend was like, you should get some stuff that doesn't smell like that after <laughs> a week. You know, it's like, yes. I'm like, okay, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. Like, so, okay, I guess you got a point. Yeah. So she turned my life around. That's that. Well, that's, that's important in a relationship. Somebody's going to turn it around, give you a little 180. Yeah. Ha -ha. <laughs> bring it back, you know, I'm, I'm a father way to bring it back. 180. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on the 180, we love to play some games and uh, have a good time getting to know you in terms of, you know, what you know. So um, this game time is about heaven. Um, given that you had that beautiful work on The Good Place, we're just going to talk about um, some things. Heaven won't always be in the answer, so I'm going to ask you some questions. Heaven won't be in the answer all the time, but it has to do with heaven. Uh, okay. You'll get it after, like, one question. Okay. So, who sang heaven is a place on earth? And I'm going to give you two options. You might know off the top of your head. I surely did not. But um, was it Belinda Carlisle? Or Debbie Gibson. Hmm. And do you know the song? Because if not, <laughs> that's all you know, I can give you, though. Yeah, no, that's the thing is that I, I actually knew, I, I knew what the song sounded like, but I just wanted to see what you would do. <laughs> <laughs> I just I was like, is he gonna sing at me? Um, yeah, is it? Ah, oh, dang, I don't know. Is it? Is it Belinda Carlisle? That is. Correct. Hey. It is Belinda Carlisle. Yes. Yeah. Right. Debbie Gibson sang a bunch of other songs that, you know, when I hear them, I'm like, oh, that's Debbie. But I don't yeah. know off the top of my head, no. <laughs> unfortunately, you know. Um, second question. This 2001 Chris Rock comedy was inspired by a Warren Beatty film. The 2001 film is described as after dying before his time, an aspiring black comic gets the second shot at life by being placed in the body of a wealthy white businessman. Do you know the name of the film? Oh. I, I have two options, but you might know it. You might know it, but I can give you. Uh, get, can you give me the options? Okay. I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know the title. Yeah, yeah. It's, is it Heaven Can Wait or Down to Earth? Oh, Down to Earth. Correct. There we go. OK, all right. Well, two for two. Yeah. Well, like okay. 1.5, but all right. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, number three, who said this? Two things inspire me to awe. The starry heavens above and the moral universe within. And the moral universe within. Albert Einstein or Ralph Waldo Emerson? Oh, I don't know. I'm going to go ahead and take a guess and say Ralph Waldo Emerson. Okay, okay. Oh! <laughs> First one wrong. 
I know it, it was it was hard, and Albert Einstein said it, and I found that out, and I said, "Ooh, who would who sounds like they was they would say it though? Who sounds like they would really <laughs> say it?" And so I'm 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 glad that you I'm kind of glad you got it wrong because that means it was a convincing alternative, you know? What yeah, I mean? yeah. Um, I mean, I had no idea, so you know. Yeah, I guess I could have put like anybody. Yeah. Um, <laughs> number four, the 1990 cover of Knocking on Heaven's Door by Guns N' Roses was featured on the soundtrack on the soundtrack to this Tom Cruise 1990 film. Top Gun or Days of Thunder? Days of Thunder. That is correct. Hey. Yes, good, good. Um, all right, number five. This Mariah Carey song this Mariah Carey song's Billboard record for most weeks at number one was recently broken by Lil Nas X. Is it One Sweet Day or Hero? Oh, One Sweet Day. Yeah, that that one was I like I like to read yeah. that and I put my I put my finger on the correct and I was like he gonna get that. That's, <laughs> that's, that's pretty. Like, uh, there's, there's there's plenty of time for me to disappoint you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> there's plenty of time. So yeah. Okay, now this one, uh, this, this is the last one. I think you're going you're gonna to get this. Uh, this 1998 movie starring Nicolas Cage and Meg Ryan features the song Angel by Sarah McLachlan, which also can be heard in many of those infomercials about sad dogs. Um, do you know the title of the film? The song is Angel, 1998 movie. Nicholas Cage and Meg Ryan. I don't know. I want to say City of Angels. I think you want to be right. Okay. All right. Yes. That is correct. All right. So you got that was six questions and you got five out of six. That's that's not bad at all. That's that's we give you an, a round of applause. Uh, press play. On the <laughs> <laughs> just keep it like that. No, just like real right. short. <laughs> right, right, right. Just I miss it. That's it. Um. Okay, well, yeah, you, you, did, you did pretty well on that. I mean, you know, the, the questions were all a little bit all over the place, but you had a good time. Yeah. Um, now I'm gonna just try to get to know you a little more by asking more silly questions, um, but that aren't trivial related. If you could have any fictional character as your imaginary friend, who would you choose and why? So like an example would be Mickey Mouse or just some fictional character. Hmm. Uh, fictional character as my best friend? It's as one of your friends. It doesn't have to be your best friend. Okay. You as, want it to be your best friend, it can. Okay. Um, hmm. You know, probably the first thing that's jumping to mind is Voltron. But yes. uh <laughs> <laughs> yes, you want this is like to... yeah, like I got a homie, he's made out of mechanical lions, you right. know, and just like bringing him around, he's huge, um, you know, <laughs> don't buy they, don't nobody mess with me, I got Voltron, I yeah. got Voltron right here, yeah, he's got a sword made out of light, he doesn't say much, you know, like <laughs> yeah, and, and was that your first thought partially because as a kid, you enjoyed him, or is it like protection or? I mean, what did you all talk about? We well, Voltron doesn't talk. It's just all <laughs> the people inside Voltron's lions talk. And so, um, <laughs> so I think, I mean, I'm not sure if Voltron even qualifies as a character, but to me, he's a character. But like, oh, I, yes. I, I, yeah, I just, I remember I was obsessed with Voltron as a kid. Yeah. I was obsessed with it. And I know that they had like a reboot of it on Netflix a couple of years ago, and I meant to get into it and I just didn't. But like, um, yeah, I was just, I don't know, I was just obsessed with, you know, I, I don't know, this is, this is not what I was thinking as a kid, but I think in mm -hmm. retrospect, I think it was the fact that all these little, like, sort of seemingly weak characters would hop into these things and become this incredible force. Yeah. You know, some of them, you know, like, there was, like, characters that were, like, small, and some that were just, like, you know, not physically adept, and um, you know, and, and then they would jump into their lines and go save the universe. And so I was yeah. just, oh, I, I, I think I liked that they weren't, um, 
that they felt like, oh, they felt like like people. They felt like characters that could be people in some way. And so I, yeah, I just I I loved it, and I just loved that you know Voltron had a, a sword made of light, and then there's another version of Voltron where he was made out of cars. So I mean, it's it was just <laughs> right. It was just yeah, it was aimed for, it was aimed at kids, and so yeah. But it's always I, I, in the back of my mind, Voltron. Well, that, there might be a future movie in there. You know what I mean? Who knows? Yeah. You might be manifesting this moment where <laughs> <laughs> you will have a Voltron best friend and you all will go on adventures around the universe or multiple universes. Yeah. <laughs> what sport would you compete in if you were in the Olympics? Uh, I, I would want to... I would want to do like the 800 meter run mm. um, because it's like right in that weird spot in between like the 400 meter dash, which is all speed, you know, and, and this, it, it is like a lot of calibration too. But I mean, the thing that people say about the 800 meter run is that it's that weird distance where you really have to game out how you're going to run this race. And you have to have enough in the tank for a kick at the end. And so it's just something mm. about that, which is, you know, it's like riding that line between a full on sprint and a long distance run. And I've been into running lately. And so it's, you know, mm. um, not, not, not hardcore, but just enough. <laughs> not, not preparing for the Olympics. Not but... preparing for the Olympics or any races of any sort, <laughs> but I do enjoy it because it's meditative. And so it's like, yeah. you know, it's sometimes I like doing that little, like I like doing like a half mile just to see how long I can keep up mm -hmm. a decent pace, like a, a real pace, not just a jogging pace, but like an actual run pace. It's kind of fun to do. So. And do you usually, um, when you're running, do you typically listen to stuff or do you uh, go back and forth between listening to music or podcast or, uh, or, or nothing? Oh, I listen to music. I listen yeah, to music. Yeah, it, it, yeah it, it hurts too much uh, yeah, to not right. listen to Okay. And I can't, um, and I can't listen to podcasts because I stopped paying attention mm -hmm. um, just because I think with like music, I'm just imagining myself playing it and having a good time. Mm, yeah. Whereas when it's a podcast, I'm very aware of trying to follow, trying to follow something, yeah. how long they've been on this particular vignette or topic. Mm -hmm. And, and so I just, you know, and then, I, then I'm not paying attention. I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm suffering. So music is music is my jam. <laughs> nice. Uh, who is one of your favorite three named actors? Yes. <laughs> and, I, and by that, just in case anyone's confused, Daniel Day Lewis, or you know, any three named actors or actresses. I, I you know I've actually got one. Uh, Jason Butler Harner. Okay. Uh, he is, I actually, I did a show with him back in Dallas hmm. in 2002 or 2003. Um, we were doing Hamlet. He was Hamlet and he's like the best Hamlet I've ever seen. Nice. And, um, and he's, he's like also a New York theater kid. He's done like a bunch mm -hmm. of stuff in the city. And every time I see him, I'm just like, damn, this dude is good. You know, he's just one of those actors. So when you yeah. see him on stage, you're just like, this dude is just, he's just, he's just good without efforting it. It's like, mm -hmm. I really enjoy watching him. And, you know, he's also been on, you know, been doing a lot of TV and film in the last couple of years. So it's, yeah, I, I, I just, he's one of my acting heroes. I love watching him. Awesome. Well, I'm definitely going to look up Jason now and, and make sure I try to see the next thing he's doing. Cause that's, that's, um, that's cool. And, and I love Hamlet. That is actually my favorite Shakespeare play. And so anytime that I hear that someone killed it as Hamlet, I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I could have seen it or I try to get to see it. He did, man. It's like, uh, it, it's, I'd never seen Hamlet play that way before or since. And it's, mm. I, I just, I, and it's not like he was adding a bunch of bells and whistles. It just felt immediate and it didn't yeah. feel like he was just, um, he wasn't like, just so attached to the idea of Hamlet. He was just, it was just specific to him. And I, it was, it was great watching him play that part. It was the mm. clearest I've ever seen it. It was funny. Um, like oftentimes I find that when I watch Hamlet, I, I'm, Hamlet is usually not my most favorite 
performance to watch in that show. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, because there's other characters that I just identify more with, you know, and I really, because of, and I think it's because of his performance, I really identify with Hamlet very, very strongly. Mm. And so, yeah, it's the best I've seen. Love it. Um, So I'm going to ask you a few more, more questions that are specific to you, your career. Um, Tell us how you got your start in show business. Um, I, um, so like the, the business part, I think was actually my first professional job was, um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I went to school. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, there, they were doing like a Shakespeare summer stock, uh, thing there, Shakespeare in Santa Fe. And, uh, I was, yeah, I was 20 and I was like, you know, I think I just finished my sophomore year of college. And were you studying right? acting? Yeah, I was studying acting. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they were looking for, you know, younger actors to play, um, you know, the four lovers in Midsummer, And, okay. and I, I got one of those parts and I got like this other little part in Measure for Measure. And that was like my first professional job. I've been studying for a little bit and, um, you know, like I, so that was like the first, that was the first paid job. And then I actually went back to Texas after graduating from College of Santa Fe and uh, started working in the theater scene in Dallas for a couple of years and actually got my equity card down there. And, um, and then I, then I moved to New York in 2004, uh, four, yeah, late 2004, mm-hmm. and just pounded the pavement for like about three years doing showcases and readings and workshops and yes. oh, um, hanging out at EST all the time and, mm-hmm. you know, doing that sort of thing. And, uh, and then like about, about three years into being in New York, I got my first actual weekly paycheck contract with a uh, my e theater company uh, oh, awesome. doing yes, a show Ma-Yi. by yeah doing a show by lloyd's uh called children of Vonderly. and then um yeah i've uh, i've just sort of been just at it ever since that was that was like sort of when it when things started to i started to string together jobs uh mm-hmm. after that and started to primarily make my living as an actor uh after that show nice and within before that uh you know when you were in college or before you were in college was there a moment that you knew that acting was what you wanted to do or performing was what you wanted to do um you know i well my mom actually kind of made me do theater in middle school because i was shy and so (laughs) she was like you we've got to we got to shake you out of this you know and Uh and so and i had no interest in doing theater um You know, I wanted to do, I mean, I wanted to do sports. I wanted to be a jock kind of, but I, I mean, I'm not gifted in that realm at all. (laughs) And I also wanted to, I wanted to play music, but you know, I, it was, you know, I, I, I I remember my mom just being like, I, I think it's really important that I had a choice between music and sports. And she really wanted to push me to do sports because, you know, for a couple of different reasons. One, I was a chubby little kid and I need to, I need to work out. (laughs) And two, um, I think she just wanted to have that sort of, you know, that really have a lot of male camaraderie and Mm -hmm. teamwork in my life. Uh, because she was at this point, she was a single mom, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, because my dad had passed, you know, a bunch of years before. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she was like, this is, this will be good for you to, to have. And so, um, Anyway, that's a complete tangent. I she made me do theater because I was um, because I was shy and and so I I had this idea that it was going to be really corny, a bunch of like uh-huh. wearing tights and pumpkin pants uh-huh. and getting down on one <laughs> knee and singing cheesy stuff to some girl up on a balcony. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. And um, I found that for me it was uh, I. A, it wasn't that, you know, it was, it was a lot of other things, but as I I was um, doing a lot of improv in a lot of these classes and finding ways to make people laugh and finding Mm -hmm. that, 
um, I was, you know, I could, I could do that, you know, that uh, it was, it was not hard for me to make people laugh. I mean, it didn't mean that I didn't fall on my face a lot, uh-huh. but I mean, like, right. but every now and again, I would get a big laugh from people. And that was like a really huge, um, I don't know, that was just a huge boost to my ego. And yeah. so and especially at that age, I mean, in middle school, high school, when you want to be either accepted or validated, all that great stuff. Yeah. It's like, oh, I can make people laugh. Oh, people are entertained. Oh, yes. great. Yeah. 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 And so <laughs> and so I kept doing it just, you know, just for fun because I was enjoying it. And then in high school, I started, I, you know, I was doing it and I was doing it more at first just because I was like, I need an extracurricular. I kind of like this. So I'm going to keep doing this. And uh, senior year, I finally had sort of, you know, made my decision that I was maybe going to pursue this in, in college, just because, mm. uh, you know, I was, I was, you know, I was actually, I was actually pretty good at it for a, you know, 16, 17 year old. And, uh-huh. um, and I decided, I remember like the night before, maybe two nights before the Texas State Thespian Festival, I decided to audition for schools just on the lark and I was like you know what I'll go and audition I'll audition and see how it how it goes and um and I'll major in it maybe and then I'll probably find something that's more stable over the time that I'm studying uh-huh. in school but then you know I got to school and it was just I I I just loved it too much to not really you know not really just go for it and yeah. so Um, so yeah, I think that it's like, you know, starting in middle school, my mom forcing me to do it. And then again, getting into college and being like, dang, I, uh, this is, I, I love doing this. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't really enjoy anything the way I enjoy doing this. So, yeah. yeah. And knowing as an artist, as a creative, we have those moments where it's like, this is what I love to do. I don't see myself doing anything else. And then some shit happens and you're like, yeah. why am I doing this? <laughs> how, how is it possible that something that brings me so much joy can bring me so much pain and heartache and frustration and, yeah. you know, so I guess talk about some of those moments or at least one of those moments um, for you and how you kind of pushed past that. Oh man. I, you know, the, the harshest one for me um i remember uh i was you know i've been doing my thing in theater for a while and in new york and you know i was i was stringing together jobs i was making it barely 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 making it (laughs) but you know i was actually that was how i was predominantly paying my bills and my rent and and you know ignoring other bills obviously but like yes. um yep, i do understand <laughs> <laughs> but um you know the the thing that the the first time that i really found myself like yo this hurts i don't mm. i this hurts was i i remember i was um i had come out to la um this was after uh after a pilot season and um and that previous pilot season i had had like a really real a really close call and it was really it really that hurt you know it hurts to get that close it always hurts to get close yes you know because you a you're not sure if you're going to get it get there again it -hmm. seems like it took forever to get to that opportunity and then it's like well dang man is it going to be another three year cycle before i get another shot at something Mm -hmm. that's going to like just allow me a little breathing room for, you know, a year. You're right. Um, so, but this 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 particular time, I remember I had gone out. I auditioned for this uh, pilot presentation, and uh, they they decided that they 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 weren't going to cast me, mm-hmm. and they were looking for like a, a name, like a, a real like sort of comedy name mm-hmm. uh, for this. Uh, it, it wasn't even the lead of the show. It's like, you know, like the lead's best friend. Right. And, um, and I, I didn't get it. And I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, like that, that happens. I guess I was in the running. The best I can hope for is to make a good impression and hopefully they right. call me back in at some point. Yes. Which and, is truth, but uh, sometimes hard to, a uh, hard pill to swallow, but it's true. Oh yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. You know, 
and so I, um, I wound up, you know, coming back to New York, I get a call from my agent, like, remember that thing that you auditioned for that they said they didn't want you? I was like, yeah, they're like, well, they want you then. And I was like, wait, what? Right. And you you had one of those moments. (laughs) Hallelujah. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, so I was like, well, okay, great. You know, like, I'm, uh, I, what do I got to do? They're like, you know, we need you to fly out, um, you know, in the next, like, day or so. I remember at the time I was broke, and I think my agent at the time fronted me the money to fly out there. Mm-hmm. And um, and we, we do, we're getting ready to put together what's called a pilot presentation, which is usually just like a short little piece of a pilot, not the whole thing. But we decided to do the whole thing in front of a live studio audience. Oh, wow. And uh, I get there. We rehearse for the week. We, um, you know, get the rewrites. And we, we do the show in front of a live studio audience. And it, it goes great. It goes like so well and I'm like I can't believe this is my life right now I'm working on this sitcom like it's just for the audience it's like and and for the execs but Uh I'm on a lot in front of a live studio audience getting laughs yes you know like that's just like that felt amazing and so this is my life yeah yeah and and so you know it was like okay so we made the pilot now you just gotta wait and we'll see if we pick it up or something like that And, and um and I remember I was like, I, I went back home. I was just sort of waiting to hear. And then like the, the, the sort of time limit that they had on that hold lapsed and they wound up paying us for an episode of TV. And I was like, great. Wow. So you, you're paying me more, more money just to, just to hang it's out. Just wait. This just is amazing. Wait. I'll do yes. that. And, um, and then I, you know, in the, in, in the interim, while all this is going on, I'm actually you know, in contact with the creator of the show and the lead of the show. And, you know, we're, we're going back and forth. We're having a great time. And, you know, he comes out to New York and we're, uh, you know, he's like, man, like you, you killed it. And, you know, I'm just, you know, I fought for you for that part and I'm glad that you did it. And, you know, all that stuff. And I'm like, that's great. And he was like, you know, it, no matter what happens, you know, with this, uh, with this network, I have other things in the works and I would love to work with you. And I was like, that's great. That's amazing. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I thought like, wow, okay, this is, you know, it's based on relationships and I, I, I made a, I made a friend here and I, I, I have to, I have to say for anyone that cannot see my face, which is anyone that's only listening, I am on the edge of my seat. <laughs> I am so nervous about whatever's about to happen, but, but yes, keep going. Okay. Well, okay. It, it's, it's a story. Yeah. Everybody, every, every actor has at least yes. something like this, <laughs> right. but like, um, so anyway, more time elapses and I read in like the trade papers that the show that I had worked on with this guy got picked up mm-hmm. and that they were going to make something out of it. And I was like, dude, that's amazing. So I, um, but I hadn't heard anything from my agents yet. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe it's like they'll make the calls later. I didn't know how this works usually, right. it's, you know? And so I, you know, texted this 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 guy and I was like hey man I heard that your show got picked up that's great and you know no matter how it goes like you it's well deserved and I'm pulling for you and then I remember me and my girlfriend sitting down having a sandwich at Court Street Grocer Ooh, in Brooklyn remember? it's that specific yes you better have oh yeah the specific memory oh. and that's when I got an email from my agents just basically saying you know, subject line was the title of the show and the body of the email was like, it's not happening, man. They're, you know, they're retooling the whole thing. Everybody that was on uh, the show is now released, uh, fired. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and um, yeah, they're going to move forward with a complete retool of the, of the show. And I remember like, you know, like, okay, this 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 stings and I remember like texting the dude like oh so I just heard from my agent um that it's not it's not going I'm not going forward with it but mm-hmm. I just wanted to know no hard feelings I understand how that goes and it was just like there was no response after that ugh, ugh. and I was just sort of like 
Uh, and here's the thing. I'm the king of the ghosters. I'm a terrible ghoster <laughs> myself. I can't be mad about that. I'm awful at it. Uh-huh. And so, I mean, like, no shade about that. I think that the thing that really stung was just that we had had this dialogue over the course of several months right. that led me to believe that either A, you know, we were going to work towards something or, you know, B, we were going to be on this show or, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I don't know. I just, I felt like after sitting down, having meals, having drinks, hanging out, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, and I gave him an out, you know, basically I was like, look, you, I'm not mad at you. You know, it's right. like, you can just be like, I'm, I'm not going to hound you about this. We're not going to, we don't need to have a back and forth. Um, but I would have, you know, it would have been nice just to say like, yeah, man, that's just how this goes down. And then that would have been it, you know, but just, right, right. Some, yeah. you some know, response. but it's, but it's like, you know, holding out, you know, the thing is like, you're off the market for so long and then you're just, right. you're just fired. And uh, that, that hurt, that hurt because it was like, those opportunities don't come up often, you know, yeah. they, 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 I think for me, it's like, I would, I, I had to, I had to basically bat, you know, a pretty, I had, had to, I had to have a pretty good batting average in order to mm-hmm. consistently work. And because I just didn't see like a ton of auditions all the time. It wasn't, you know, there's those people that talk about going on auditions, like three and four in a day. That's never <laughs> been me. Like, you know, huh? I'm, like, do that at, huh? I'm like one a week. Well, yeah. wow, that's an embarrassment of riches, you know, like that's yes. what it was for the longest time. And so, yeah. um, and so that was like one of those times where I was like, well, I don't know where I'm going to get back to this, you know, yeah. like these opportunities don't come up and I finally got one that went my way and it's like, it's going to be, a, it's going to be another couple of years, I guess, before yeah. I get another shot. And that, that almost, that almost, I mean, that was depressing. That, that yeah, busted me up pretty good. Um, you know, I have, that. I, I have a sound for that. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds fucking sucky. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, but, you know, you're here now, you made it. So was there, for that situation or a different situation, something that helped to, bring you out of that um because yeah absolutely like that feeling of um having such high expectations for this opportunity and then it looking one way and then turning a completely different direction and not going your way was there something whether it's friends faith um yeah was there anything that you would say this really helped me through that challenge um meditation my well, like, I mean, honestly, like my relationships helped, mm. helped me up a lot. Um, yeah. You know, my girlfriend has always been very um, level-headed when it comes to dealing with the ups and downs and disappointments of this, of this industry. I mean, she's, yeah. she's a performer too. And so it's, wow. she gets it, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I also had uh, a really great set of roommates that I was living with Hmm. at the time that you know we were all going through a bunch of stuff you know and we were all just sort of figuring it out and and it was it was really nice to have somebody like just a group of dudes that were just like yo bro that sucks and now let's go have a couple of drinks and have a weird late night (laughs) obscure music dance party just yes. dudes yes, yes in the apartment and, and just, yes you know just like hoodies up yeah it's like oh, oh, oh. yeah just yeah, like, like let go yeah, yeah just let go <laughs> just like hoodies up all sorts of dumb stuff happening and it's just like it's you know like that was it was it was a lot of that which sort of like pulled me out of it mm-hmm. um honestly playing um i mean at this particular time, I don't think I had started playing like consistently with the U.S. Open, but like mm-hmm. I think that over the sort of peaks and valleys of the last uh, few years, uh, playing music with the U.S. Open actually helped quite a bit because just having an outlet that isn't tied to my livelihood—it's like art, right. 
that's just we're just doing it for us we're doing it to have fun we're doing it because we enjoy it and there's no stakes other than we just want to get in the room and get weird it's like those those things really really helped a lot um you know you're playing the drums in the u.s open right yeah yeah and is it um and i'm gonna share this might be a little ignorant but is it percussion or the drum you know like are you on a drum set or will you every once in a while like pick up a tambourine or like oh i mean (laughs) you know yeah every now and again i pick up a tambourine or i just put it on the hi-hat but i'm usually on a drum set yeah just a kid um yeah it's therapeutic as hell man it's like when you're mad right just just beating the shit out of a snare real fast is (laughs) all all you need um and so yeah it's yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, it's great. It's, it's been a lifesaver in a lot of ways for me. Because um, mm. I'm not particularly a good musician. I just enjoy it. And it's, mm. it's just for fun. And know? I think about, because I know when I was in middle school, there was a moment when I thought I was going to play the drums. And uh, <laughs> <Were you talking? laughs> like, I, I said, I said, yeah, I want to do this. I want to do this. And then it was like, then when I got in front of a drum set and I was like, wait, my foot has to do what at the same time as the left hand has to do what? And then the right hand has to be ready. What? So yeah. I just, I, the coordination, I just couldn't really get it. But I remember like loving that idea of being able to like, but the other element of it is my parents were like, I don't know if we want you to be drumming. You know, I don't, I don't At know the if, house. We really, yeah. right, if we really want you to invest in this idea. Like it, yeah. it's, it's a nice idea momentarily. Um, so with that in mind, do you have a place? Like, how do you practice or where do you go? Or like when you were starting out, was there a place where you were like, okay, I'm just going to be in the apartment? Like, oh yeah. Oh no, no, no. Like, oh, low Lord, not in the apartment. No. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, um, um, we actually just got rehearsal studios. We would yeah. play up at uh, Funkadelic in Midtown. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, um, it was just a bunch of studios and really good vibe, really good people that work there. And so we like going there. And um, also Complete Music Studios in Brooklyn. So it's mm-hmm. like one of those two places. That's where we go and we would, you know, we would play. For, yeah. Um, I mean, we would play, I mean, we just get in there and would not take a break for like two hours. We'd just be wow. banging around, playing yes. like one jam for like 45 minutes. Love and, it. You know, out of that, there would be like maybe five minutes that sounded like a song and the rest <laughs> was just like, you know. It was therapy. I mean, it's all therapy, but yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was just like, get it out. And, yeah. yeah, but that's how we actually built our songs. They're like built out of these extended jams, like these little moments that are like, that works. That's a, a good foundation for something. So let's let's move on and, and let's explore this little piece and keep building on that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really rare that we actually go in there and have a song that we're going to play or someone's mm-hmm. written something beforehand and it's like, you play it exactly like this. It's like someone may come in with a loose idea and people mm-hmm. will jam around it, but it's, everything is generated in the room. And yeah. so that's something that's really that's nice because you're not up there just executing you're like you're actually contributing and trying to you know creating something with with a whole bunch of other people which is yeah. that's great it's it reminds me of you were talking about you did improv before as you know as an actor but yeah. it's like improving as a musician it seems like in in those moments um with a group of collaborators trying to create a song, create music together, which is, yeah. is beautiful. Yeah. What? Uh, so this is a very uh, specific, specific kind of weird question, but I'm interested in like, I was raised watching Dwayne Wayne, Steve Urkel, and I feel like there's a interesting um, cultural moment of like the black nerd, right? Mm-hmm. And I think your character on The Good Place like contributed, f- falls into that. Have you found yourself like, what has it been like being the icon of like a community of people? Has, have you had any weird moments with that or reckoning or like? You know, I mean, it's, you know, I, I feel like, I don't feel like I'm, 
it's interesting to feel like I'm a part of tradition of black performers mm -hmm. and, 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 and sort of expanding uh, this particular archetype, you know, it's just a, you know, because it's like, oh, right. we grew up with it. Like these, like characters like this exist. Although I got to say, I never thought Dwayne Wayne was a nerd. I thought he was, I always thought that he was cool. And it wasn't yes. until I got older that people were like, he was a nerd. I'm like, he was not a nerd. I felt the same way. I'm so glad you said that. Cause yeah, when I was a kid, I was like, oh no, Dwayne Wayne's cool. Yeah. But yeah. And then as I got older, I was like, no, people were like, he's a nerd. And I was like, wait, I didn't think so. I didn't really think so. I knew he was I a mean, nerd. I mean, Ron was supposed to be suave, but he wasn't really. Ron was like a jerk. Oh, he was goofy. Right, he was so goofy. He was so goofy. Yeah. So I was just sort of like, <laughs> you know, I, I just remember thinking that like, yeah, you know, Wayne was, was he, he was, he was cool. I mean, he was, you know, I mean, like he, he, he was, I mean, he was thirsty. I mean, like, right, <laughs> like right. it was that. I mean, but it was like, <laughs> I didn't necessarily just like equate thirst with uh nerddom right so, right um, and like to be honest i mean now now i'm really having a reckoning with it i'm like wait a minute because initially in the early days of a different world it was like he and denise were going to be a thing so he was like really he was the man in this in the sense of like a romantic lead yeah and then it kind of like got a little confusing about like who the potential romantic lead was and then it became very clear that it's like okay this is Dwayne wayne and whitley yeah. but i think like that is major as compared to you know steve urkel was like nobody was supposed to yeah. be interested in him everybody was like yeah. okay move we're not paying attention to you in terms yeah. of the ladies with him but and like you know kadeem hardison's like a categorically good looking dude it's mm -hmm. just like you know it's like objectively yeah, yeah. a good looking dude so like you put glasses on you just put glasses on a good looking dude you know, right. So that's that's really all it is, you know. Uh -huh. He's still like charming, you know. It's like so. It's just like I just never thought he was uncool. I, it was I don't know. It was a real sort of. It was a real reckoning for me. I was like, wait uh -huh. a minute. Am I was I supposed to was I supposed to think he was a nerd? Wait. I didn't think that at all, you know. Um, but it's cool to be a part of that. Like with this character is sort of like joining that. I feel like that's sort of the lane mm -hmm. that 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 the character Chidi sort of like leans into a little bit, which is, mm -hmm. you know, I think Chidi leans harder on the nerd, you know, like it's, uh -huh, he's, right. he's significantly significantly more nerdy than yeah. Wayne Way was, but I think it's like in that it's in that world to me, of you know, like not so like it like nerdy but not 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 being cartoonish necessarily right. all the time mm -hmm. yeah because um, i think that's something that we see with nerds is like it's just everything's amped up so high mm -hmm. and you know it's i think the thing about uh i think the thing about Dwayne wayne i think the thing about you know uh about chidi is that it's it's like these are guys that were yeah they're nerdy but it's just it's just a little more toned down. It's like the nerd mm -hmm. that you would actually meet somewhere. Yeah. You know? And, and they, they've got complexities and it's like being able to see ourselves on, on television, ourselves represented as intelligent, but also maybe a little, you know, maybe, uh, maybe not, a, um, maybe a little not with the times, but still in the times and of the right. times, you know what I mean? So it's like these little things that could be considered nerdy. And it's like, no, there, there are real people out there that are complex that aren't, you know, may not be saying the hippest new slang, but are like relevant and, uh, and deserve love and deserve to be loved. <laughs> they deserve love. <laughs> they deserve love. Yeah. Um, with the varying moments of coping with loss and getting to success, what was a moment that fa felt like a huge transition, like a 180, a moment when you were standing in one place and you were like, things need to change and you decided you had to turn things around? Um, you know, I think my, I had to say my, 
the biggest turn, turning point that comes to mind right now is the moment to, to take a break from theater to try and get on camera work. Um, that was that was a that was a tough decision. Um, mm. You know, like I I think it was I I hit a point where I was, you know, I was working a lot and I felt really fortunate and I really enjoyed the work that I was getting to do for the most part. And working a lot in theater. Working a lot in theater, okay. specifically. Mm -hmm. But I just got so tired of balancing my checkbook in my brain on stage the last run, week of the run of a show. Yeah. You know, being like, okay, so I have, I got a waiting week. I'm gonna get this last check on this. You know, it's like that, that thing. Yep. Like, doing that, I'm like, dang, man. It's like, like I, I, here I am on stage performing for people that are paying the price for a ticket that I, as a performer, can't afford to pay. Yes. You know, like I couldn't mm -hmm. afford to go and see myself. You know, like oh, yeah, and, yes, dude. And, and like just years of that. And I remember actually, um, I was doing this show, and I actually was like, you know what, I gotta, I gotta make some other money. I'm tired of feeling like I'm just barely holding on all the time. And in the middle of a show, I remember like, like the preview period was done. I was, I was asking people like, does anyone know anything that I could do for side work? You know, because mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I know I'm doing these eight shows a week, but I, uh, I need it's something else. It. Yeah. Not cutting it anymore. I'm I'm too old for this, you know. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm too old to be this this close to the bone all the time. Mm. And so um, I remember I, I feel I, I feel like my I think I did one show. Um, I think I was it was a, a show at Playwrights Horizons was the last like full production that I did before I took this break and mm -hmm. um, and it was. It was it was uh it was necessary. I was actually starting to I was starting to get depressed and bitter about yeah. being an actor. And I that's not a fun place to be. And yeah. I was like, I need to I need to get my head right because I'm not enjoying this. And um it's starting to feel like it's more effort than it's worth. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I need to I need to take a take a second and and it got dark for a while, you know, like it got, it got really tough, but. And with that break, was it, it was a, it was a break not knowing what was next. Like you were, right. you were saying, I'm not doing any more theater work for now. Yeah. But you didn't have another opportunity right in front of you. No, no, yeah. I didn't. And I, I was just like, I gotta, I gotta see what happens. I mean, it's like something that a lot of people have told me was like, you know, sometimes you have to in order for the thing that you want to come into your life you have to make room for it you know and so Message. <laughs> and so yes. that was you know so for me that really meant like not always being tied up in a play it meant being yeah. available it meant sitting still for a second not knowing what's going to happen that month and that's terrifying but i was mm -hmm. i just knew that i needed to do that and um and so, yeah, I think it was around that time when I had, I had, I had stopped doing theater for a while, really stopped doing workshops, readings. I was pushing all of that to the side. I was doing mm -hmm. some on-camera stuff, but not a whole lot. And, you know, things weren't sticking necessarily. And I had sort of made the decision to, um, to maybe transition out of acting. I had no idea what I was going to do, mm -hmm. um, but... <laughs> I was just you thinking like, maybe I need it? to, yeah, this, I don't think this is it. And, yeah. you know, I think a lot of actors have that moment where they're like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And then you think about it and then it feels like you're really losing something if you don't do it anymore. So you're just like, you know what? No, I actually don't want to lose this. I just, I'm just mad at it right now. Yeah. And for me, that conversation, when I had it at that point, I thought, you know, like, do I, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And it actually felt like a relief. Mm. Um. And so, so was, there was something different about this time. There was something different like, about, oh, okay. Whew. Yeah, it didn't feel like I'm giving up. It felt like I don't have to do anything if I don't want to yeah. do it. It's like, I don't have to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I remember like that was around the time when I was uh, 
audition for The Good Place. And I was like, I decided this is going to be my last pilot season. I'm just going to throw everything I have at getting a TV job or a movie job yeah. or something so I can just see if there's any room for me in that world. And, um, you know, I, I will attribute that sort of relaxation to just kind of being like, this is my last time doing this. This is my last mm. time going into these rooms. This is, um, you know, I'm not going to be auditioning all day, every day for the rest of my life. This is going to be the end of it. And so I just meant that I enjoyed it. I just meant, yeah. I just enjoyed being in the room. There was no pressure. It's like, if I get the job, great. If I don't get the job, I'm already done. I'm not going to have to right, live with right. it much longer. So it's like, um, wow. Yeah. So it, it was, it was, it was nice. I just went into the room looking to give the performance I wanted to give rather than looking to get a job from somebody. Yes. Wait, I have to. <laughs> I really meant to hit message, but still, um, <laughs> but still, because I, I mean, I, I think a lot of performers and actors talk about that, about the energy of like when you feel when people sense that you're desperate for it or that you need it, that somehow it comes across in what you do and what you bring into the room, the energy that you bring with your audition. But other times when you're just like, you know what, I'm gonna give y'all what I wanna give. I'm gonna do it for me. I'm not worried about booking it. I'm just worried about like having fun or enjoying that sometimes something completely different comes across to those folks who are watching and that's the thing you end up booking is the thing that somehow you didn't have the stressors or the pressure of like I have to book this or this could yeah. be it um so it's interesting that you say that yeah yeah it's 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 I mean it it's really liberating because the thing is it's like don't get me wrong it's like I've definitely gone into rooms given the performance I want to give mm -hmm. and then have, have folks say like we don't want that at all <laughs> You know, <laughs> like, and yeah. I'm like, okay, that's, that's fair, you know, okay. um, but I think also it's, it, it also felt like I had a little agency because it's like, well, you know, if th these are the salient points of this part for me, these are the things that are really speaking to me. Mm -hmm. And if you want someone that's drawing different conclusions from what you've created here, then you just want to give that to that other person and that's right. okay. You know, like that's, that is their part. They are, they fit into the thing that you want to do. And, you know, it's, I've been lucky in that some of the more recently, the things that I want to do with a part line up with what a creator might want. And, mm -hmm. um, and then you can, you know, navigate from there. And so it's, um, you know, it, it's, but it's nice. It's nice feeling like if you didn't get a call back, it's because, you know, if you didn't get a call back, you didn't get a part or whatever. It's not because, you know, you tried to do the thing and you failed at it. It's like you did the thing that you wanted to do, but they didn't want you to do that. And that's right. okay. That's, and that's you okay. know, yeah. like that's okay. You know, then you feel like a creator, not just like you're just going in there just trying to just trying to ask for something or to just mm. execute. You're like, I wanna I wanna create and I wanna yeah. help you create the thing. And and uh yeah, so anyway oh, that's, that's that's a yeah i mean I, I really like what you said about then you're walking in there as a creator because there is a distinction about you know if, if you walk in feeling like you created this role this not as opposed to this role was created for you like yeah. i created this role i'm bringing my full self my full creation to this role versus i'm gonna give them what they want i hope i give them what they want it, there's just such a different um mindset attached to that so yeah that's, that's yeah Great. And it's not to say that like that mindset never enters in ever mm -hmm. again. I mean, it's like, of course it does. It's like, there's tons of jobs that I've gone out for where I'm like, I kind of want to do this, but I think it's like the text really dictates that this is the way this is supposed mm -hmm. to be done. I also want to try to do this. I want to see if I can give them what they want because like, that seems like an interesting challenge or also, I just, or maybe I just want this job in particular because there's other things that are really attractive about it. Um, but it's, it is like, I think at its heart for me, it's most important to go in and do, do you because no one else can do that. No one else can, you know, like there's, you just like sitting down eating chips on the couch is going to be different from any yes. other person doing it. And so it's like, that's 
what you know well, just just do you that's the only that's the only thing that we have that no one else is going to have is us yeah. so you know hallelujah <laughs> do you that's yeah it's it's real you know? um and so, <laughs> Speaking of do you, I don't know if this is a good transition, but I went there. I did it. Okay. Um, love life. I'm excited because, you know, you are going to be a black male lead in a series about love life. Um, how, what was that process like, whether it was an audition or, you know, what was that process like? And what are you excited to explore if you can discuss it in terms of having this opportunity to be a black male lead in a love story and a love a, a series about love um you know i am i am i'm 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 excited man i mean like it's you know like i i i got to say it's like you know, the rom-com is not my go-to mm-hmm. choice for entertainment. You uh-huh. know, it just, it just isn't. Yeah. And, you know, when this was starting to, you know, be, become a possibility, I actually watched the first season of the show and I was like, oh, this is great. This is, mm. this feels like, the thing that I love about the show is that it feels, it feels messy. It isn't mm. cute. It, it's not, it's not yes. like a cute romantic sort of you know it's it's like it gets messy there are some really cute moments there are some really wonderful sort of like those moments that everybody loves in the rom-coms and stuff sure uh-huh. there's a couple of those but really it's more about a young person trying to navigate what it is to be an adult in new york city and mm-hmm. that's dating is a large part of that for a lot of us and so yeah. um i think that it was just a very well-rounded discussion and uh, an interrogation of what that is, what that means. And, and so I, I really, I, like, I, I just, I was like, oh, wow, I never thought I would watch a show that has love in the title somewhere, oh. but I really, <laughs> I really enjoyed this. I really, really yeah. like this a lot. And, um, you know, the world felt really big and, um all the tropes were avoided you know like these i mean that's important yeah yeah it's like there's things about it that was just like this is really quality stuff and they use they they use the dating you know trying to find love thing as a way to discuss other stuff Mm -hmm. and you know that's so that was so when you know this opportunity came my way i was like oh hell yeah i want to do this this is great i i would love to do this and you know you know i yeah, it's like I, I mean, like I, I am excited at the prospect of being a black man in this particular, um, in this particular format, you know, yeah, because it's yeah. like I, I, I think that it's, um, you know, it's, it's not like black love stories don't exist. They, I mean, you know, it's like yeah, that's, they that's, exist. They <laughs> exist. Um, I think that. You know, it's, but I, I think that this is a show that had a white woman as its face right. for the first year and to have a black man as the face for the second year. Um, it's sort of, it's, I, I'd like to think that it's, it's sort of breaking the ideas of what's for what demographic. Yeah, you know? totally, yes. It, and, so like I I I I'm I'm excited for that. Um, you know, as far as the stories that we're gonna tell, I mean, we're still figuring that out. And, yeah, yeah. You know, I have, I have a friend who I'm gonna shout out, Dallas Rico, who uh, who was who was trying to be in the writers' room, he, he didn't quite make it. But you know, there's something for him. Do you, yeah. Dallas? Do you? There's still <laughs> something for you. Um, but yeah, but I'm but you said the stories you you all are still working on. Yeah, and yeah, we're still working on it, and it's. Uh, you know, it's going to be a different thing. Like this was like, you know, Anna Kendrick season was about, you know, a woman finding, looking for her person, you know, just being in the city and looking for her person. And mm-hmm. this, like my, my season's going to be more about someone who was in a long-term relationship mm-hmm. and then finding that that relationship is not the relationship that they actually should be in and yeah. launching into the world, you know, 
older and you know with 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 a different kind different set of scars you know and mm. and so i i i'm really interested in that you know um and so yeah i'm 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 super excited i i i could not be happier to be working on on this show with with people that I think create really quality stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And well, I'm, I'm definitely excited when, when it, when it's released in 2021, I'll definitely be watching and, and excited to just see, uh, yeah, the journey of the character. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering with the various work that you've done thus far, what is something that you look forward to in terms of, creating the legacy of William Jackson Harper? Like, are there things that you're looking forward to or things that you want to put in place uh, that haven't happened yet that you're like, okay, this is like back here in my brain and I know one day I want to do it, but I'm, you know, I'm still working on it. You know, I, I, uh, hmm. I don't know. I, I think that it's, I mean, I think if you'd asked me this question like 15 years ago, I would have had like, like, you know what, man? Here's what I think, and this is like told you. <laughs> I think just like as I'm getting older, it's I really I just want to at the end of everything for the work that I'm doing to hopefully mean something to somebody. You know, mm -hmm. like that's really all I'm concerned about. It, yeah. Um, like constructing the legacy is not something I'm actually. I'm just not thinking that far down the road. It's, uh -huh. I just, I'm like, you know, it's like every now and again, I feel like I do some good work in a scene and I, I just want that to stick with people mm. some. And, you know, that's, that's all I'm concerned with. And yeah. oh, that, that, that touched me, that surely. Because, uh, you know, I, I think we imagine <laughs> also often, especially people that have made it to a certain level of success that like, you know, they're always thinking, you know, 10 steps ahead and, and have these plans and 50 million things, which some people do, some people do, and that's fine. But I think like being able to say, the moments that I do good work, I want that to land on people. And I just want to consistently do good work like that is admirable in the sense of just being able to be present and being able to uh, value the, the work that you do and not constantly be looking for the next or trying to be uh chasing the next but like say i'm here i'm present and i'm grateful for the work that i do and i hope it touches people yeah that's 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 really that's all i can hope to do i mean uh you know it, it's it, it, i yeah it, this is It's weird, like as I'm getting older, like certain dreams get smaller, um, and not and not and I don't mean that in like a bad way. I don't mean that yeah. in like a, you know, well <laughs> I'm jaded now. There's no way that's happening because that's just <laughs> not that's not what I mean. But it's like, I just mean that like certain certain things become um, I guess it's like. I don't like taking big swings at big issues that I haven't done a whole bunch of thinking about, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so it's like, so when it comes to, you know, like creating a, a, you know, quote legacy or something like that, it's like, you know, um, I just, I, I don't, I don't know that I'm smart enough mm -hmm. to know what folks are going to need and what's going to be important later. I know, yeah. but I, I do know what's important to me right now and what's honest yeah. and what's coming from a pure place. And so like, I'm, so for me, it's like trying to do good work is that's, that's the thing that's honest for me. Mm -hmm. I, I want to do that. I want to do good work. I'm really curious to see if, if I can like really, you know, like, like mine, like just mind my guts a little bit and see what mm -hmm. what what's really truthful and uh and hopefully it, it lands and it stays and it, it resonates with people and that's that's really all that i can do that feels honest uh yes. beyond that it's that's me that that'd be more about me no i guess the other thing would feel more about like my vanity than anything else and mm -hmm. 
Um, the honest yeah. place. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> the honest place. Um, so we wrap up the 180 with a quote. And so I'm going to say this quote and just let me know if it, uh, what it means to you, if it impacts you in a certain way. Your profession is not what brings home your weekly paycheck. Your profession is what you're put here on earth to do with such passion and such intensity that it becomes spiritual and calling. And that's a quote from Vincent Van Gogh. Okay. Yeah. All right, Vincent. Yes. Right. Such passion and such intensity that it becomes spiritual and calling. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it was that for him, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Huh. And would you say, I mean, and this doesn't have to go into like a whole big thing, but would you say you feel like the work that you do is spiritual and calling or not necessarily? Or You know, honestly, this is the way that I feel. It's the way that I feel most useful, mm. like being in, in this way that I feel that I actually contribute in some way. And, and so that is important to me. Um, yeah. And I don't know. I don't know if that, I don't know if there's a spiritual aspect to that or not, but I, I, I do. I like to feel like I'm useful in some way to people that I can and some people that I cannot see or will not know. But I just I just yeah. want to be useful. And so um, and so like that's that's sort of what doing. Like pursuing this. Uh, this career has been about. Um, it's uh you know on my on my good days it's like I, I i just want to feel useful i want to like you know maybe make someone laugh maybe hopefully help them understand something about themselves or whatever and on the bad days it's like that's you know at its worst i'm that's where how that's how i define my self-worth you know mm -hmm. which is not good necessarily right, that's right, right. that's that's pretty problematic and that's something that i fight mm -hmm. um you know, every now and again. So, you know, yeah, there is, I mean, I guess maybe there is a spiritual aspect in that it is like kind of ethereal and, and it's kind of hard to grasp onto at times and mm -hmm. there's two sides to it, but, um, but being useful is like the thing that I really latch onto. Yes. Well, thank you so, so much, uh, Will. Uh, William Jackson Harper. Uh, I just, uh, that's, uh, it's such a good, wait, oh, no, this was an intentional question that I did not actually ask. Where did the three names, like, when did you, what, was there the moment that you decided I'm not going to be William Harper? Oh, uh, actually, Actors' Equity decided that for me because <laughs> I showed up in New York and uh, I had gotten my equity card. I had, like, gotten all my equity weeks and paid my equity dues and stuff in Texas. And I moved to New York and I had, got, I had not gotten my equity card yet. And I was like, why haven't I got my equity card? I like applied for this months ago. And they're like, oh yeah, that's because your name didn't fly. And I was like, well, wait a minute. They told me in Texas that I was fine. And they're like, and you believe them? I was like, yes. You know? <laughs> and, yes, it's Texas. Yes. No. And, so, um, <laughs> and so then they were like, you have to change your name. And my actual middle name is uh, 11 letters long. Oh, and okay. they were like, you either have to change your first name, change your last name, or insert your middle name. And so I, um, I was like, okay. And I thought about it for a while and I didn't want to change William. I didn't want to change Harper. And, um, and so I was like, well, let me just take my mom's maiden name, nice. place that in the middle. And there we go. And that'll be the professional name. But you know, like it's that I've always been just Will Harper to like, that's, yeah. that's, that's, <laughs> You know, no one says William Jackson Harper unless right, it's right. being introduced or I'm being introduced or something. Uh huh. You know. Yeah. Well, thank you, Will. Yeah, we we want to you know cast. Yeah, yeah. This, this, <laughs> thank you, Will. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, thank you, Will. <laughs> yes, of course. You know, my middle name's Michael, but um, you know, that's the Eric. stage thing. <laughs> Mike. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> And I want to make sure folks stay connected with you on Instagram. So you all can find Will on Instagram at William Jackson Harper and on Twitter at Dub Jack Harper. So Dub like the like D-U-B, like W, you see, that's smart. That's real smart what he did there. But at <laughs> Dub Jack Harper on Twitter. Um, is there anything else that you want to shout out? 
Oh, uh, oh man, I feel like I'm supposed to, but I just never think that far in advance. So I, <laughs> like, That's cool. no, shout out yourself. Shout out to you, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, I appreciate you. And it, this has been fun. It's always fun just like chatting with people, getting to know them and, and hearing their stories and consistently being inspired by the ways in which, you know, we deal with the ups and downs of life and finding ways to consistently get back up. So, so thank you so much for sharing. And uh, I'm going to give you a little round of applause. Oh, oh. Okay, well. <laughs> That's a great way to end, isn't it? Isn't it? Just like a little comedy. A little comedy for everybody. Especially Here we go. Wait, hang on. Wait, wait, huh? Wait a minute. Hey, now. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so, so much. Uh, 